Well, good afternoon here, and this is a serious day. This is Good Friday Day, and, um, well, very soon to you will be coming up with a broadcast, which we start at uh, 6 p.m. GMT, and I thought I would just go ahead. I won't have much more time. I thought I would go ahead and um, I would Uh huh. Okay, now I'm I'm better. Okay, I might have been muted there for a little bit, but uh, just a long time. But anyway, this is Good Friday, and uh, we're going to be um, commemorating Good Friday in another three hours or so. But I thought I'd have a chance to deal further with the fourth initiation, because after all, that is the day. That is the initiation associated with the day. In the East, it tends to be called the Great uh, Renunciation. That's a different thing. And uh, one might renounce in various ways, and the little renunciations prepare for the big ones. That would take us sometimes off into a cave which doesn't sound much like the crucifixion, does it? Well, in the West, we call it the crucifixion, and only the empty nail-marked hands can be trusted with the bounties that are given to the spiritually uh, inclined and, the, and those who enact the spiritual truths bringing the divine plan um, into existence. Well, um, it's an important day. Let's just put it like that, a very, very important day. It may not be celebrated in the future, DK tells us, and he makes the surprising comment that um, even the Waysack, at least as we know it, will not be celebrated in the future. I was just talking with Tuya about that. You know, we realize that when the Christ is here, <clears throat> visible among humanity and those for whom he came, especially visible for those for whom he came, uh, many things will be changed. The commemoration of the death of the Christ will give way to the realization that after all, he is resurrected, the reincarnation is the truth, and he's here, he's here. And the Buddha will be helping him, part of the uh, triangle surrounding the Christ with the avatar of synthesis and the Spirit of Peace. So we have much uh, to look forward to. It's called the wonder of the new age. Master DK occasionally references it, the wonder of the new age. We have difficulties uh, through which to pass uh, as we seek this uh, wonder and prepare for it properly. And everyone must renounce attachment to the unreal. And in that renunciation, commemorated today especially, we have to release just about everything. Well, everything unreal. We release that which is Unreal, and we move into a situation 
where reality governs our every thought and truth is the master of our life as is given in one of the important mantras that Master DK has uh, shared with us. So as you know how I'm doing this, um, just what comes to my mind, and people have told me sometimes what comes to my mind is of value to them, and they do uh, see some new connections. And uh, as we see new connections, we move forward, forward that state, which we call a pure reason, a buddhic quality or city, it's, it's probably, uh, in a way, I think, uh, associated with the fifth subplane of the Buddhic plane. In some manner, it's a Mercurian factor, and it means we don't just think about things, we actually see them with straight knowledge and we understand immediately, in an intuitive manner, the connections, and the interplay between many factors. Well, the fourth initiation clears the way to that. It's a great clearing and it allows the monadic energy to enter and become a real factor in our lives. It really begins that monadic impression at the fourth degree, but there's still a lot of clearing to do as one prepares to be rid of, uh, strange as it seems, the obstacle of the causal body. It's such a beautiful assemblage of energies, uh, one, hardly one, one in a hard way over so many millennia and even millions of years. So why should we want to dispose of it? But there's just a clearer sight that comes when we enter the cosmic uh, Buddhic plane, uh, well, cosmic uh, ether, the fourth ether, which is our Buddhic, Buddhic plane. You notice that sometimes I am speaking more slowly. It's not just that. Sometimes it is, you know, loss of connection, but on the other hand, sometimes it's to give us uh, opportunity to really ponder on some of these deeper matters by adjusting in such a way that we don't rush through the material. But anyway, we're at the uh, beginning of program number uh, three, and... Um, as I say, in a compilation prepared by uh, Zach Rymill of New Zealand, I, I find, you know, he's, he has a lot of insight there, and he's just, you know, the, as far as I'm concerned, uh, a compilationist, compilationist <laughs> uh, that uh, really provides material for us, which is extremely useful through the accentuations that he manages to uh, extract from the teaching. So we're in Dina 2, and I'm not going fast. We'll just see, you know, how long this all takes, longer than I have, I'm sure. I sometimes feel I, I could just... Uh, keep talking about these matters, hopefully in a semi-enlightened way. All through the time that the new dispensation will be offered by the Tibetan. We don't know how he'll do it or through whom 
he will do it or, you know, or whether he'll take advantage of the computer technology that we have, but we know that the time is rapidly coming around the year 2025 and we really have to prepare for it and how do we do it by um, assimilating, I would say, what has um, so far been given to us an impossibility naturally, but as it is true that he's given us more than we can ever assimilate, as he said, more than you can ever absorb. But we've been given something and we do our best uh, to use it. So, you know, my, my hope is that uh, in these coming years, we we do about as well as we can do, in addition to helping as well as we can help in the more practical matters, which are esoteric uh, matters. So going on, this is Dinah. Um, this is discipleship number two. And it's page 136. Let's just read, and uh, when things come to my mind, I will uh, make a little statement or offer a question. And we can think together as if we're conducting a uh, study group uh, intent on absorption as much as possible of the great ageless wisdom. Therefore, as you prepare for the meditation process, which you will undertake during the coming year, I guess this is to a particular, well, I don't know if it's to a particular person, maybe, or maybe it's to the whole group, whom he sometimes calls my brother, the whole group, you know. Uh, we, you will undertake during the coming year, start by a consideration of the ashram, of the hierarchy itself. That's the whole thing, all seven ray ashrams and its leader, the Christ, and its supreme leader, uh, Sanat Kumara, since the ashram is uh, the ashram. The hierarchy is the ashram of Sanat Kumara. Start by consideration of the ashram and the hierarchy itself of its relation to Shambhala, certainly the higher uh, beings within the hierarchy are of the sixth degree and are directly related to Shambhala. Some of these are, um, yeah, relation to Shambhala of its constitution formed as it is of many ashrams and, you know, sub-ashrams, ray ashrams and their growing number of subsidiaries. Now, later as we become more wide awake, we'll know what subsidiary ashram in which we're, subsidiary ashram in which we're working. Maybe a lot of us are working in that subsidiary ashram, which is managed by Master DK, who also manages to have, I believe, something like five masters in his ashram, and maybe they are masters of the subsidiaries. But it's all well planned out, and we will understand uh, increasingly uh, where we belong and where when we understand that you know we can work with uh, additional uh, strength power effectiveness some of these uh, ashrams are working under the chohans uh, you know a ray ashram like uh, 
the uh, several ashrams in the secondary group working under the Chohan master J.H. Uh, Futumi. Others are working under the masters, the lesser ones, I guess, and some of the ones that are on uh, scientific lines and are still maybe on the first subplane of the uh, of our mental plane, of our solar mental plane. Even the fourth degree initiates can be the directors of some of those uh, more concrete ashrams. So some are working under the masters and some are embryonic as yet, being gathered slowly by adepts of the fourth initiation. So already we will have a view once we reach that high stage of what we are to form. Now it's not really impossible because so many adepts of the fifth degree will be needed in the development and blossoming of the new age. It's not beyond our reach. At the same time, it is dangerous to exaggerate. Uh, one's position that always leads to error and it uh, misleads others so we you know we watch that carefully that we don't overestimate uh, our position as dk has said somewhere that the beginner is always more conceited than the experienced worker so will you endeavor to realize the factual nature of this great living spiritual organism? No, we ponder and uh, what really is the hierarchy and not what so many more naive groups think. Even their images are uh, glamorous and uh, give off that child childish and inaccurate uh, glow which has nothing to do with uh, reality will you endeavor to realize the factual nature of this great living spiritual organism it constantly substands or underlies the world organization so underneath everything, no matter what effects may appear to tell us, uh, lies the guidance of our elder brothers, our spiritual parents, so to speak. And they are subtle, but things are moving slowly in the direction they conceive without them breaking the law of freedom from Sirius, which demands that uh, disciples and um, aspirants and those who are willing be left in freedom to determine their own ends. And finally, of course, humanity has to be left in freedom. There may be these big acts of God and uh, those acts leave no room for free will. They just are, and one has to conform to them in a planetary sense. But, you know, so often it's a case of not disturbing the free will of uh, those who are moving towards greater uh, enlightenment and love and sacrificial power. See it as a growing, vital reality of such life and potency that it can break through or break up all limiting outer organizations. It's like Uranus breaking up Saturn, you know? They both are effective on the physical plane, but Uranus is archetypal. And Saturn, though 
extremely important on the physical plane and cosmic physical plane and on a number of the odd, odd number of planes, um, Saturn is not quite the archetype that Uranus is. So Uranus breaks up Saturn. Some of us were born with Uranus and Saturn together. And we note how the archetype is always intervening in our lives and breaking up the conditions we have created through our desires and thoughts and how others have uh, contributed to the creation of those conditions. So there's a um, ongoing interplay between the, let's say, the planetary energies. And we have to emerge with the best uh, coming out of that interplay. Saturn and Uranus are particularly interesting. With Uranus, you do get some placement along the Piscean 246 line which is Syrian. Uh, not so much with Saturn, though Saturn does uh, connect with the law of karma, the intermediary law of karma, which is said to uh, be active uh, within the star system Sirius. Actually, all the synthesizing planets are active there in relation to Sirius, the law of freedom, Uranus, uh, it's the brilliant star of sensitivity, inspiring the Christ, that's Neptune, and then of course, the intermediary law of karma, and that's Saturn. And there's an interesting uh, planet out there, hypothesized, and Charles Jane really had a handle on it, and those more psychic uh, mathematical third-ray workers that he was associated with. And uh, the Tibetan seems to mention it, and it's called Isis. And it takes, uh, you, know, you know, in terms of approximation, it takes 360 years for Isis to make its uh, revolution around the sun, and about 360 days for Earth to make its revolution around the sun. A day equals a year, you know, and that's a magical formula really uh, in astrology. So I think we're going to find uh, Sirius, Isis, and the Earth closely connected. Of course, these are the mysteries. And we will receive the mysteries when we are suited to receive the mysteries, <laughs> not just for the curiosity or love of knowing, but for their usefulness. The masters, when they are given this interior arcane information, um, they're given it when they can use it. And uh, curiosity, killed the cat, you know, and curiosity is not a worthy motive. So we will know these things, and we have to have patience. Of course, you can have patience when you realize that essentially you've been alive forever. Alive, I mean, you know, a vibrant being forever, and will be, and that time is really canceled out in all this. So then the old formula about personality and patience just dissolves. Well, anyway, we all have a place, and that uh, place is uh, quite specific. The ray of the major ray ashram is fundamental, but then there are adaptations. You know, you might say uh, the pure wisdom comes from two sub one and the pure love from two sub two. And uh, 
the ability to apply with meticulous entirety um, love, loving wisdom in two sub three, and the use of uh, beauty and the arts in two sub four, and the research into consciousness, let's say two sub five, and the new world religion and uh, expansion and enhancement of religion two sub six and uh, beneficent organization two sub seven. Just check out page 71 of Esoteric Astrology and you see what Jupiter and Uranus can do and how important two sub seven is in the healing. So maybe most of those are pretty well put together or in the process of gathering. We all will find our place. and are in process of moving towards our place. Even if we don't yet quite see the destination, but there, there are within us certain tendencies which will, uh, because of their energy configuration, they will determine what our place is plus our experience in whatever ray ashram we're really in. Not so much as developed in the first ray ashram in terms of subsidiaries, but in ray three and ray six, there's some development and ray uh, two has the most development. Well, it's the ray that is the soul ray of our Earth scheme, and somehow it its emergence is the main thing now. And certainly the reappearance of the Christ in the Aquarian age, especially for Jupiter, in relation to Jupiter, for the disciples and aspirants, will bring in that second ray. I know I branch out a lot into different things, you know, I hope you can stand it. Um, but you know, everything can be elaborated upon and when Master DK says, well, there's enough here to write several volumes, he means it, volumes, and he passes on to the next subject, but he gives us just that, that little hint, you know, and as we pursue the great wisdom, we'll know more and more of what he knows, and uh, we'll become outposts of his consciousness and uh, able to be of service to him and to the higher ups that he <laughs> represents, his own master in the Christ and Sanat Kumara. So the future is rosy. But the challenges are great. The point in the center of the group is the master. He's monadic even in a certain respect. He's, in a way, he's like the soul of the group, but he's also the monad of the ashram, at least symbolically. The point in the center of the group is the master until after the fourth initiation when the point in the center is the Christ. And that's so interesting because it's a time when a more direct hit from the monad occurs and the Christ becomes the center of the group, the larger ashram, head of the hierarchy. Later, the point in the center is Sanat Kumara. So we see there's nothing static about any of this. What there is, is a changing of different degrees of power in apparently the same position. The Master, the Christ, and Kumara. And I suppose we can take it further, you know, it will eventually be the solar logos and on and on until all is one.
Well, uh, people like ourselves, we'd be, you know, lucky to have the master as the point in the group. We can refer to the Christ, the great teacher, of course. And he may say, well, who touched the hem of my garment? He was very aware of all that would be going out from his particular aura. But to come into direct rapport with the master, that is to become an accepted disciple, intensifying as we go. And eventually the head of the Ray Ashram, when one's status uh, earns that, and eventually the Christ, which would mark a higher degree of initiation still. And of course, Sanat Kumara as the very center of things, a still higher degree of attainment. We don't have to think so much about the planetary logos, pure and simple, of whom Sanat Kumara is an expression, nor do we have to definitely not think of a the solar local says the center of any triangle that we're basically functioning practically through. Although maybe the masters, some of the higher ones, begin to think in those terms. Here's Dinah 2, page 250. The first reaction is called the formula of revelation. There are a number of them, you know, these revelations and is related to the united sensitivity of the group. That reminds us of the first and second of the Dina initiations. A lot of us are concerned with simply being sensitive. And the next step is that we're so unified with the group that its sensitivity becomes a matter of great importance to us. As together, the group members brood upon and come to an understanding of the formula. What are there, about six formulas there? And as we get into the very higher ones, they become more mysterious and more obscure. But, you know, we've been given them, and so we can follow them through. Be a student, after all, you know. If all of this was given to you, utilize it, study it. I guess, you know, someone of my type emphasizes the study angle, but of course, equally important is the meditation and the service. As together the group members brood upon and come to an understanding of the formula, they will swing into responsiveness to the feeling and sensitive reactions of the individuals in the group. So group sensitivity leads to enhanced uh, individual sensitivity. And these together constitute the astral body of the group. Well, the first couple of initiations really are uh, not initiations, excuse me, meditations are trying to sensitize the astral body. Of the group and um, we have to get through a lot of that personal stuff. A lot of those personal ties and sentimental reactions and uh, jealous competitions and uh, disobediences, you know, we have to get through those four detachments that are found in the beginning of Rule 11 before we can really with profit meditate upon the growing sensitivity of the integrated group so much ahead of us. And of course, we cannot deny that um, Group training in the Aquarian age would be a really big thing. Yeah, a really big thing. 
and I'm hoping that uh, I'm looking here to see whether this was pulled and I'm hoping that what I've been talking about for about 30 minutes here has come through with reasonable audio fidelity. You've always got to check your connections, whether it applies to everybody. <laughs> you have to check your connections. That includes, of course, the uh, connection of the mental unit to the soul and eventually of the mental unit to the monastic permanent atom. Just make sure your connections are not loose. <laughs> okay. When this reaction has been established and a spirit of non-criticism and of love will greatly aid in the process. So important, right? You know, I'm sure we all can take exception to what our fellow disciples are doing because maybe they're not doing it in the same way we would do it. So we might even, you know, I even start to criticize. And that, of course, would be uh, working against the integration of the group. Such subtle things, aren't they? It's always easy to let our little dweller rear its head and uh, find a way to show that we're in a better position than our fellow disciple. It's hard to catch yourself doing that, but you know, you catch yourself doing that. So a spirit of non-criticism and love will greatly aid in the process. And then the group together can arrive at the second purpose of the formula, which is called the discovery of the point within the circle. It's got to be the master, you know, with that changing point. Always there's a point within the circle or sphere, and eventually you're, you're going to discover, and so will I and so will all, that that point is uh, we ourselves. I, the we, ourselves. We are the point. Finally, within the circle. It seems sometimes that we are taking away from the status of a great being when we say that, but we have to realize there's only one being. And uh, to find the right way to do that and to Avoid the glamours in so doing. That's a big task. So, discovery of the point within the circle. Yeah. This signifies, as far as the group is involved, the revelation of a central coherent force, of the central coherent force of the group itself. Well, sometimes a, a group of higher disciples within the ashram are that force when considered united. And sometimes it's just, you know, simply the master. This signifies the revelation of a central coherent force. This is, at the same time and until after the higher initiation, which we call the fourth initiation, so we realize, you know, who he's writing for here. He's not really writing for fourth degree initiates, is he? This signifies, um, the master at the center of the group and the group is always changing 
you know, obviously for Master DK, he thinks about a higher central point of coherent force. Probably in one step, the Master Gurumi as the central force holding the whole second ray ashram together. And Master Gurumi would be thinking of the Christ, and the Christ would be thinking of Sanakumara and Sanakumara of the planetary logos. Although, you know, in a way he is the planetary logos, and yet he's not another enigmatical idea. And the planetary logos, of course, would be thinking. Well, probably of the solar logos or some intermediary point of several planets holding them in relation. So when that higher initiation, which we call the fourth, uh, is uh, passed, it's the master at the center of the group that is the central coherent force. I mean, what, what do you think of this? the central coherent force. I mean, in a way, it's your soul, solar angel. In another way, it's your monad. In another way, it is Master DK himself as the teacher with his uh, training ashram, larger ashram, holding it all together by means that he knows. So this is consequently the correspondence to the jewel in the lotus. The master becomes like the jewel in the lotus. At first it is the jewel in the lotus. Then the monad, which is bejeweled, becomes the jewel in the lotus. And somewhere in there, between, comes the realization that um, DK is like the jewel in the lotus for his ashram, and so is every master. And every higher center becomes like a jewel in the lotus. It's so interesting, the jewels in the crown, the, um, the monads and the collections of them are jewels. I guess maybe symbolically speaking and maybe more literally than we think. And they're put in the crown of deity, arranged in a certain way. I suppose in terms of color and the ray nature of the planetary logos, I mean, it's all thought out. There's so much that we might think, oh, well, that's just kind of random, but you no, know, it's, it's just perfectly thought out in terms of uh, archetypal reality. And eventually we reach that, uh, archetypal reality. So this is consequently the correspondence to the jewel and the lotus where the individual is concerned to the hierarchy where humanity is concerned is like a jewel and to the central point of life in all forms that point of being a form and of consciousness the circle and the point are the natural symbols, and we can apply them to different levels, can't we? We may think we're just looking at the same symbol, but each one of them has a, uh, a particular status or level of application. This applies to the atom, to man, to the planet, and to the solar system. The concept must constitute the foundational idea of all reflection upon this uh, formula. Well, I wonder, of course, we're skipping a little here, so not taking it in sequence, so you know, kind of wonder whether that's the formula number two, where we see the all these lines of radiation coming out from the central point. Could be that. 
and it's the general principle, isn't it, that the circle becomes the point, and the point itself becomes uh, part of a, a new circle, which has its still more interior point. Finally, there's only one point in all of cosmos, and that one point, it does disappear. We are that point. Nothing's allowed to remain as a point. Because reality is, you know, I joke about it, but reality is pointless. It has no room in it for articulation or differentiation. And points are somehow the indication of articulation and differentiation. Well, there's lots of branches we can pursue here. Suffice it to say, one day we will be the head of an ashram, and uh, we will be a point, uh, kind of a positive uh, central uh, nucleus to a bunch of electrons uh, gathered around that nucleus, even though positive as we may seem, we're still an electron to a greater point. And uh, each point grows in intensity. These are points of tension. They are points through which essential nature shows in ever-increasing intensity points. I have a lot to say about points, whether it's accurate or not, we'll see. And uh, I'm developing that in the uh, Identify as Being uh, webinars. I realize I've been absent for a little while trying to get myself back in shape and uh, get my not self back in shape and uh, meanwhile this uh, virus uh, pandemic has come in and we don't know at this stage in 2020 what it will lead to whether it will be recurring or whether it will stop short of being the horror that the spanish flu was after world war one or whether it will go on in a recurring manner. Until there's been a great cleansing, because I suppose humanity really does need a cleansing before the great conclave. And uh, something around that conclave, DK tells us humanity will realize uh, it cannot solve its problems, its major ones, all by itself. So he certainly encourages independence, but at the same time he encourages realism, and I believe that what we call the hierarchy of uh, brilliant minds um, will be somehow recognized. There will be found in humanity people who can solve the problem, or at least really direct towards the solution of the problem, then it's a question of uh, humanity's humility, whether to accept this or not. Because there's a lot of pride in Lucifer, <laughs> and in a way, uh, humanity is Lucifer, as the Tibetan seems to hint. And uh, we may be bright, but uh, we have a lot to learn. Well, let's see. Here's Dinah 2, 258. I am at this time 
and I want to just get this correct. You know, I am at this time carrying the current teaching anent current teaching upon initiation a step forward. Long time ago, this was written, but you know how many people have really grasped it. And I'm seeking to show that it is not essentially a process of soul personality fusion, though that has to be the prelim preliminary step. And when we're in the arcane school and going through the light of the soul and so forth, we certainly recognize in its meditations um, the preliminary essential nature of that step though that has to be a preliminary step, but of monad personality integration. That's what initiation really is. Being of the monad integrated with the uh, steps which bring the monad in extension into its lower expressions in a recognizable manner. Monad personality integration carried forward because of an attained alignment with the soul. Initiation is in fact the essential. Well, in other words, we have to align with the soul and the soul is the, at first, at least the heart center of the monad and when we have that kind of alignment the monad can come through and later when the soul body is um, destroyed or dissipated the monad can come through even more powerfully at the fourth degree which is act after all what we're talking about so if jesus yells out my god my god why hast thou forsaken me? My God is the solar angel. And it forsook Jesus because something within his own nature still greater was destined to be the impelling uh, form of expression. The power of impulsion from the monad the time of the solar angel then was over. But of course, the solar angel keeps on evolving and becomes, you know, planetary logo and other things. Planetary logo, I think, in groups of 49. It's amazing how numerically calculated this all is. So this is uh, the step of a monad personality integration carried forward because of an attained alignment with the soul. So that's the first step. Initiation is in fact the essential and inevitable process of transferring the primary triplicity uh, of manifestation into the basic duality spiritual uh, spirit matter. So the triplicity of the soul disappears, and with it, the three become the two. And of course, eventually, the two have to become the one, and the one has to become what we can call the none, if we really understand what what that is. So spirit matter is on its way and monad personality, let's just say monad soul infused personality, it's on its developmental way. It is the dissolution of the intermediary. That's what we're talking about here. Temples are good and they are beautiful and they are ideal and they uplift and uh, one day the they are not uh, electrically allowed to in a way interfere or to capture a more direct form of energy that we call electric fire 
So it is the dissolution of the intermediary, and to this the crucifixion and death of the Christ, not really he, of course, was dedicated and intended to be the revelation to the initiates of the past 2,000 years. And that's it, you know, who gets it? For abstruse matters such as these are, it's the initiates who have to understand. To the initiates of the past 2,000 years, of the transmutation of the trinity of manifestation into the duality of purpose. So the three becomes the two, becomes the one, becomes the none. This is the progress of it all. And we've always been the none, meaning that uh, we are the great absolute zero forever, but we subject ourselves to limitation, which is illusion. And then we have to retract that subjection, re returning to the unity, and the unity returns to something that is uh, even much more fundamental. I cannot word this in any, any other way. I bet he wishes he could. But the enlightened will comprehend my meaning. The interpreters of the gospel and many disciples of the Christian dispensation have singularly failed to grasp this revelation. Well, they had only so much understanding. They have laid the emphasis upon the death of the personality. Good Friday, here we are. I'm doing this broadcast, this webinar, on Good Friday. Whereas when Christ experienced the great void of darkness and chanted aloud the occult mantra, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was recognizing simultaneously the distinction between his robe of glory symbolized by the partition of his garment by the Roman soldiers, you know, in a way the egoic lotus is that robe of glory and the angel of the presence participates in having made it, become it. He was commenting on his robe of glory and also calling attention of the future disciples and initiates, when they could understand, to the disappearance of the middle principle of the soul. Well, let's just say that limitation of consciousness on the higher mental plane, which we normally call the soul. Soul, of course, is consciousness, and it's a cosmic principle. And not until the very heights of uh, universal reamalgamation does the soul apparently disappear into something still greater, which is pure being? Well, it's, um, it's a great unification, and all traces of duality are disappearing, except a functional duality, which is necessary in Maya, because of how we operate, creating a Maha Maya, or a universe, cyclically. He was projecting into the world consciousness the recognition which must come of relation to the Father or the Monad, my God, my God, the first God, the angel of the presence, the extension of the solar angel, why hast thou forsaken me? And then there's a higher God waiting. The Father waits, awaits. This great dissolution is culminated for us at the time of the third initiation. Well, I, I, I look at it as a kind of culmination, but going even further at the fourth. But things do begin to fall apart in the causal body at the third degree, especially the knowledge petals, we are told. 
The great dissolution is culminated for us at the time of the third initiation when the light of the monad obliterates the light of the soul. Let's just say we function a lot more according to the light of the monad after that point, even though it's not the full expression. And uh, man obliterates the light of the soul and the material atomic light of the threefold personality. And this is especially uh, consummated at the fourth degree, I believe. But, and here is the point, the recognition of his death and its effects is only symbolically enacted and recognized at the time of the fourth initiation, the recognition of this death. All lesser dissolutions, deaths and renunciations, and disappearances of that which the lower nature holds and is held, are enacted in relation to the accustomed aspects of form life and of conscious sensitivity and awareness. They are simply preparatory to and symbolic of the final great dissolution of the causal body consummated at the crucifixion. So, you know, here it is, Good Friday, and this is really what we're talking about. And the Christ, too, undergoing at a, a much higher initiation at the time that he was overshadowing and guiding the initiate Jesus through the oh, more form-deadly um, dissolution of the personality and of the causal body. This leads to the resurrection or uprising of the personality, soul, consciousness. Maybe that's the first resurrection. Second is the seventh degree after which the personality is uh, certainly, if not Maya Virupic, uh, gone. <laughs> so the resurrection or uprising of the personality, soul, consciousness, duly fused and blended into that of the monad. Well, there's a triple blending, so we get the soul-infused personality, that's how we get rid of the middle uh, vehicle. And uh, the personality takes it. And then we have a duality. And eventually we will have not just a duality, we will have the monadic unity. This is finally carried to the point of solar perfection at the ascension initiation, which is, uh, well, should we call it the sixth degree? In a way it is. And sometimes we hear that he ascended and sits at the right hand of the Father, which would take us to the seventh plane, the Logoic Sea of Fire, and involve the seventh initiation. So it seems that true ascension is the sixth, but there's a, still a higher ascension, which the Christ is undergoing now, and that's the seventh. These are very great mysteries. And here we are, you know, lucky to control our emotional body if we can. And, um, you know, not so many of us initiates of the third degree. Odds are really against it looking ahead into the distant future, but maybe not so distant, looking ahead some lives to the time when many initiates of the fifth degree will be needed, and maybe if we prepare properly, we will number among them because of the pressure under which we will be directed. and. Uh, forced to move forward. Well, I'll tell you what, friends, um, I'd love to keep going, okay? But Tui and I have a Good Friday uh, service meditation coming up in just two hours, and I think I ought not to get winded here, you know, because I'm the engineer, for better or for worse, and oftentimes for worse. 
So I'm just going to call this uh, quits, uh, convert it for you, and uh, keep uh, moving forward on this amazing subject of the fourth initiation, which, you know, I'm not saying we can understand it. We, we really can't. Uh, but we can come closer. We can indeed come closer. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to come so close that it becomes a reality. And so this takes us um, to page, uh, page two to page, uh, page four to page six. And this is the end of program three. And uh, we're, this is the end of program three and the beginning of program four. And probably I don't get a chance to do much of that right now uh, because of the upcoming conference. But at least you'll have a little something. There's a lot to think about and a lot to apply to yourselves, not that you have that kind of ill-chosen ambition to reach the fourth degree in this life. Uh, we're not being trained for that. But so that the future path can stand more, more revealed. That's the idea. We're going to tread this path, and well, not everybody will deliberately tread the path of initiation. Some will rise with the masses through no special effort of their own, and they will achieve. And others will push ahead under the pressure, which is the law of existence, and will achieve what is uh, very difficult. Uh, much sooner than others and uh, will be put to work accordingly, according to their achievement. And I can only say I hope that that characterizes us and all members of the new group of world servers, even if they don't know that that's what they're really doing. And, you know, we're blessed because we know something about occultism, or at least we have uh, been told and we move towards knowledge as, as students of esotericism we move towards knowledge of esotericism and occultism and it becomes clearer to us all the time so i'll put this into um conversion and i'll send it to you and hopefully there will be some Oh, little items of thought, which will help uh, connect up the whole thing. And uh, I don't know the whole thing, of course, you know, but I know something will help connect up the relations. That's my hope. And uh, as a result, we'll be moving closer to the great unity in which we are already participating could we but realize it? So lots of love to you, many blessings, lots of progress for the sake of your own achievement and for the sake of the others you will help. The will to assist must be very strong these last five years of the era of the forerunner. The will to assist humanity, move closer to participation in that uh, society of uh, organized and illumined minds, which we call the spiritual hierarchy. 
Okay, friends. When I come back, I don't know, but tonight is uh, we'll we'll participate a bit more in this question of the great uh, renunciation. So. See you then.